to all the dearest. It comes to my attention that I have not yet mentioned in this series how the world letters first came to be. As it turns out, they began as a way for my, me and my friends to write about what was happening in our imaginary worlds. They were actually letters at the time. But as the years evolved and went on, and so did our tastes evolved, uh, we ended up eventually turning them into small chunks of novels. And that's how they came to be the way they are today. They would, of course, all incorporate intros like this that would talk about what's going on with our lives at the time. So, I suppose if you're listening to this, you should let me know how you're doing in the comments below. The Eternal Bard by Einvar, the Eternal Bard. Night had fallen. Yuletide was in full swing, and Arlesir was still nowhere to be seen. I felt bad to leave her all alone to grieve, but I also didn't want to hike a mile out of the city in the snow. So I stayed and sang, and sang my heart out to the adoring crowds of Sagenheim. Children ran through the streets, playing. Men and women drank warmed mead and danced along drunkenly. Trees with glowing lights filled the plaza. It was an elaborate lie we told ourselves. Lord Gilanix would have just been happy to see that we were alive, and he would have been preparing for the future. But I sure as hell wasn't planning anything. For now, just this was enough for me. As it neared midnight, I warmed up for my final song of the night, the Segari. I saw the tired faces and the masks of joy ready to drop. These people needed something real this night. So I tuned up my Cantele harp one last time, and I sang for them. It was a song of hope, something that the Sagans definitely needed on a night like this. The song of the once and future emperor, who had pulled his enchanted sword from an anvil, conquered the whole of the north, and would come again in Thule's hour of greatest need. I had stolen that line when I had set off to sail the world. It was a sort of melodrama that made a folk hero into a legend. Of course, the difference was that I was flesh and blood, despite what I had told the general populace, and the once and future emperor was a dead man buried in some ruin in old Thule. Slowly, I saw faces lift. Smiles. Real ones. Oh, long reign the Sagari, he was fair as fair can be. He will come to rise again, and the world will know his name. As I concluded, beautiful women and eager children alike flooded to me, asking me questions, offering to tip me. A true bard would never accept coins for such a simple performance, but I wasn't about to complain about the extra change. As I scanned the crowd for more, I saw Arlesari sneaking in around the outer edges of the crowd. Timid is always that one, but with the cruelty she had endured, I didn't blame her. Slowly, I disentangled myself from the crowd and went to her. She smiled a little at me, sweetly, her golden eyes beaming up expressively. She too was happy for now, but I could see the great weight on her heart, and I couldn't blame her. Of any of us who knew him, she adored Gilanix above her life, safety, and happiness. Strangely, there was another man with her. He was simultaneously in tattered clothes and fine armor. Above his brow, he had a golden sun rune tattooed. Old Thulian, a man who respected tradition, I saw. And also one who seemed both down on his luck and very well off. I returned her smile, running a hand through the part of her scalp that still had hair, carefully avoiding the burn scars. She accepted it lovingly. She was cold. It was dangerous for me to be out in the wilderness so late, but I was in no position to scold her, so I worded it positively. Arlesir, thank goodness you've decided to join us. I was worried you were going to spend Yuletide alone. I didn't make her speak, if I could avoid it, so I didn't have her demand a response when I could talk at her, and then simply observe her response. Her threat needed the rest. And this time, her response was stoic. This was business. I turned to her strangely dressed companion. And who is this lovely gentleman here? I went to shake his hand. The man returned the gesture, eyes wide, seeming not to co fully comprehend. He looked like a mis mixture between Sagan and Thulian, and something else entirely. Arlissa cleared her throat. Her voice struggled out, like soot tumbling from a fireplace. Doesn't speak Thulian. I found him in a casket. She coughed with a struggle. Every syllable was a battle for her. I saw the man wince at her voice and stepped towards her so she wouldn't see. Stepped towards her so he wouldn't see, handing her the wine flask from my belt. 
Then I turned my full attention to this strange new man. A casket, hmm? I always said I wouldn't lie about something like that. Perhaps he was another grave robber of the old Thulean Emperor burial sites? That would explain the armor and the tatters. I addressed the man in Sagan, which Arlisar spoke poorly. Well met, good friend, and who are you? My eyes widened when he opened his mouth, and the syllables of the precursor language to Thulean tumbled out. Old Thulean, we called it. Shaking his head, I know not the words you speak. It took all my best acting to keep my jaw from dropping. No one spoke that language anymore. I knew a dozen songs in it, and that was it. Forgive me, good sir. Thou art one of the few who speak like this. Release crossed his face as he realized I was someone who could understand him. Someone who could understand in turn. How long hath it been? How long hast it been? How many ages have passed while I slumbered in my resting place? I narrowed my eyes and looked him up and down. I was so tense, sensing my discomfort at this comment. Who art thou? He straightened up and held his head high. Rhea of Solish, son of Skaha, the Sage Lady, and the once and future Emperor of Thule. I do not like how I've represented old Thulean anymore. Um, that being said, I, I'm much further along in my conlanging journey now. But I respect what I was trying to do with old English because it's 400 years between the fall of the empire and his return. So that's about um, from Shakespeare to 2000s English. And really, it's pretty understandable. So I understand why I went with that time gap. But I just think that it's a little bit cringy, especially to read out loud. Um, I think what I'd prefer to do, I don't actually know. I, uh, I We'll say that I am mostly using my Shakespeare in English correctly. I did Shakespeare a bunch um, in uh, high school, uh, so I won't claim that, that makes me a Shakespeare scholar, but I, I'm not one of the people that read Shakespeare plays and go, oh, what does that mean? I generally understand what's happening. Um, and so I'm fairly certain that the English is correct in this, um, but I just, I think what I'd want to do now is just use my old Thulean conlang, though admittedly my old Thulean conlang is also one of my worst ones, because I had to scrap it up from bits of old Thulean in this text, which is a weird, which was before I was doing conlanging, so it's a weird mix of like Norse and French and Irish and French spellings, it's French in quotes spellings of Irish words, so um, varying amounts of success there. But language is such an important part in this story, or at least in this part of the story, and later on too, where it becomes sort of an identifying factor, um, and a limiting factor uh, for Arlesser as she can't speak uh, Svanic at all, and this becomes relevant when she's in the South and most people speak Svanic. Um, so, uh, yeah. But I think that, um, I think that Einvar has a more unique voice, or at the very least more unique than Arlesser's voice, more distinctive, because he's sort of fitting into that bard archetype. Um, as I've written Einvar over the years, I think uh, while his voice has largely stayed the same, hopefully it's just gotten better. Uh, I will note the line editing in this section was not nearly as good as in the first one. The first one has been polished and polished and polished to hell, and this uh, second letter has not. It. I, in addition to, you heard me mess up that, uh, because I'm not editing these, uh, you heard me mess up that one line, but mm, it was written wrong, and also, there's way too many lees, too many adverbs in this. What was I thinking? I was thinking that adverbs are fine, that's what I was thinking. I'm a fool. Um, and before you come after me for like being an English snob, I don't think that adverbs are universally bad. I just think I didn't use very good ones. I don't think I placed them correctly. I'm definitely, um, I've read more literary short stories since I wrote that, and now I'm I'm on board. Oh, and also ing verbs. There's too many of them. I don't like them anymore. I just want it to go ed. I just want ed verbs. I want I want strong, punchy ed verbs. Um, that's my current aesthetic. Who knows? Maybe in like three years, I'll swing back and be like, actually, it's fine. Um, and <laughs> I'm being extremely nerdy about words, but that's why we're here. That's why you come to these world letters. That's why you stay for the outro. Um, so. 
Anyway, I think that's all my thoughts on this one. Oh, lastly, uh, here, note on the Sagery. I've since changed the words of the full version, but I don't think I'm going to get sued by the German uh, folk band that I have mm, stole the melody uh, for, for the chorus originally. Um, originally, back when this was just a private world, there was obviously no problem in me just being like, oh, this melody from this specific German folk band, what are they called? Um, I'll put it on the screen here. Uh, because I've forgotten, or I'll put a link in the description, uh, but they are... Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember the name. I tried to remember. I couldn't. Um, but uh, their song, uh, Lug Nassad, the chorus of that song, um, is what I've stolen as the melody. So credit, obviously, to them, and obviously for my full version of the Sagari, as you can see in my music of fantasy music of Nova Thule video, or sorry, my fantasy music of Lisea video, I talk about, or I, I've rewritten it to a different melody that is royalty-free open source. Not open source, what am I saying? You know what I mean. I'm allowed to use it. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's all. But I, I do really like the words that I've written to the original melody, I'll, even though I'm not really supposed to be allowed to use them, I think that they suit it really well. I think it feels very ballady um, in the narrative. Um, then I'm sort of pulling one of those in the those like the video game operas where they're like one to three minutes in the video game, maybe, but then in, in real life you understand that this opera is a longer piece, like it is a full two-hour opera in the narrative, but for the for the readers, that was my wrist cracking, Jesus. Um, for the readers, that's, and the players of the game, they understand that it's shorter because they don't want to sit through a two-hour opera. Though someday, I would like to see a video game with the balls to write its own opera and then make the player sit there for it. I would, probably. I mean, especially if you make it part of the plot, I will sit and watch the whole ass opera, especially if it, the whole opera is as good as Eugene's opera from Genshin Impact. I'm just saying. I. That opera makes me cry. Music is so important, and music especially is important um, to the way that I like to make my cultures express themselves. And as a person who took 10 years of piano but cannot compose a single song, um, it, is, it is extremely difficult for me to understand, um, to, to express myself in that regard other than to be like, and it's kind of like this other song, but not really. Um, you know what I mean. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much for listening to me ramble, um, and I hope you're very excited for the next installment of the World Letters of Isaiah. Have a good night.